I'm glad you could join us. Go ahead and stab the like button and stick around for the next untold story. In the sleepy town of Millwood, nestled deep in the heart of rural America, life moved at a leisurely pace. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone, and nothing ever seemed to change. The biggest event of the year was the county fair, and the local diner was the hub of social activity. But beneath the surface of this idyllic community lay a dark secret that would soon come to life, transforming the town forever. Millwood's garbage dump was a sprawling landfill located on the outskirts of town, it had been there for as long as anyone could remember, a necessary eyesore that kept the town clean and tidy. Managed by old Joe Hargrove, a grizzled man in his 60s, the landfill was a place most residents preferred not to think about. One unremarkable night in late summer, a shadowy truck rolled up to the landfill under the cover of darkness. The driver, a man with a nervous demeanor, quickly offloaded several large barrels marked with biohazard symbols and drove away leaving the barrels hidden among the mountains of trash. The barrels contained highly radioactive waste, illegally dumped by a corporation looking to cut corners. A week later, strange things began to happen. Joe Hargrove was the first to notice. As he made his daily rounds, he saw that the garbage seemed to be shifting, as if something was moving beneath it. He dismissed it as rats or other scavengers, but the unsettling feeling persisted. One morning, as Joe was driving his old bulldozer, pushing piles of trash into a more manageable heap, he saw something that made his blood run cold. A tendril of what looked like dark, slimy sludge slithered out from under a pile of garbage and wrapped around the blade of his bulldozer. Joe jumped back, heart pounding, as the sludge retracted and disappeared back into the trash. Must be some kind of chemical spill, he muttered to himself, trying to calm his nerves. But deep down, he knew it was something far worse. That night, the town was rocked by a series of bizarre occurrences. People reported hearing strange noises coming from the direction of the landfill, low, guttural groans, and the sound of something heavy shifting. Pets went missing, and a thick, noxious fog began to roll into town from the dump. By the end of the week, panic had gripped Millwood. The town's water supply, sourced from a well not far from the landfill, began to show signs of contamination. The water had a strange, metallic taste and those who drank it reported feeling nauseous and dizzy. Millwood's mayor, a stout man named Frank Thompson, called an emergency town meeting. The townspeople gathered in the high school gym, their faces etched with fear and confusion. Joe Hargrove was there, his face pale and drawn. Folks, we've got a serious problem, Mayor Thompson began, trying to keep his voice steady. Something's happened at the landfill, and we need to figure out what it is and how to fix it. Joe stood up his voice trembling. I've seen things moving in the garbage, dark, oily stuff that ain't natural. I think, I think we got something alive out there. The crowd murmured in disbelief, but the evidence was undeniable. The strange noises, the missing pets, the contaminated water, all pointed to something horrific happening at the landfill. A small team of volunteers, including Joe, the town's doctor, Dr. Emily Carter, and a few brave townspeople, decided to investigate the landfill. They armed themselves with flashlights, Geiger counters, and whatever makeshift weapons they could find, and set out for the dump at dusk. As they approached, the smell hit them first, a sickly, metallic stench that made their eyes water. The noxious fog hung thick in the air, making it difficult to see more than a few feet ahead. The Geiger counters crackled with increasing intensity as they neared the center of the landfill. What in God's name is that? Dr. Carter whispered, pointing to a large, pulsating mass in the middle of the garbage heap. It was as if the trash itself had come alive, forming a grotesque, moving entity. The mass shifted and groaned, and the dark sludge Joe had seen earlier oozed out, creeping towards the group. They backed away, hearts pounding, as the sludge seemed to sense their presence and quickened its pace. We need to get out of here, one of the volunteers shouted, but before they could move, the ground beneath them began to tremble. The garbage heap erupted, and tendrils of sludge shot out, wrapping around their legs and pulling them towards the pulsating mass. Panic set in as the volunteers fought to free themselves. Joe swung his shovel, trying to cut through the tendrils, but they were strong and relentless. Dr. Carter managed to pull out a vial of a strong acid she had brought along, pouring it on the tendrils that held her. 
The sludge hissed and recoiled, giving her a momentary reprieve. Sam we need to find those barrels and neutralize whatever's inside, Dr. Carter shouted, realizing that the radioactive waste was likely the cause of this nightmare. Joe nodded, using his shovel to keep the tendrils at bay. Follow me! I think I know where they are! The group struggled through the shifting garbage, making their way towards the area where Joe had seen the barrels dumped. The tendrils were everywhere, writhing and grasping, but they pressed on, determined to end the horror. When they reached the barrels, they saw that they were leaking a dark, viscous fluid that seemed to be feeding the living garbage. The Geiger counters were off the charts, and the air was thick with radiation. Dr. Carter pulled out a small box of explosives she had brought as a last resort. We need to blow these barrels up and hope it stops this thing, she said, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. Yeah. Joe and the others set the explosives around the barrels, working quickly as the tendrils closed in. They backed away and Dr. Carter set the timer. We have two minutes. Run! The group sprinted towards the edge of the landfill, the ground shaking beneath their feet. The pulsating mass roared, sensing its imminent destruction. Just as they reached the fence, the explosives went off, and a massive explosion rocked the landfill. The ground heaved, and the air was filled with the sound of shattering metal and the roar of the garbage entity. The pulsating mass writhed and convulsed, then began to dissolve, its dark sludge evaporating into the air. The group collapsed on the other side of the fence, gasping for breath and covered in grime. They watched as the landfill slowly fell silent, the living garbage retreating into itself and finally becoming still. We did it, Joe said, his voice filled with relief. It's over. But Dr. Carter shook her head. We stopped it for now, but the radiation is still there. We need to get experts in to clean this up and make sure it never happens again. The town of Millwood faced a long road to recovery. The landfill was declared a hazardous site, and teams of scientists and cleanup crews were brought in to deal with the radioactive contamination. The townspeople were evacuated until it was safe to return, their idyllic lives forever changed by the horror that had emerged from their garbage dump. And though the pulsating mass was gone, the memory of that night would haunt Millwood for years to come. A chilling reminder of the dangers that lurked beneath the surface, waiting to be unleashed by human recklessness. The landfill might one day be cleaned up and forgotten, but the fear it had instilled in the hearts of the townspeople would never truly fade. A dark shadow over the once peaceful town. And the residents of Millwood returned to their homes months later, their town forever scarred by the terrifying events at the landfill. The site remained cordoned off, a grim reminder of the disaster. Cleanup efforts were underway, but the psychological damage lingered. Life in Millwood tried to resume a semblance of normalcy. The Carters, like many others, struggled to put the horrors behind them. Joe Hargrove, once a respected figure in town, was now seen as both a hero and a reminder of their collective trauma. Despite the cleanup efforts, strange occurrences began to plague the town once more. Residents reported seeing dark, slimy residue on their lawns, and hearing unsettling noises at night. Pets went missing again, and people started falling ill, complaining of strange symptoms reminiscent of radiation poisoning. One evening, as the Carters were having dinner, they heard a faint tapping at the window. Mike's heart skipped a beat. He slowly got up and pulled back the curtain, only to see nothing but darkness. Probably just the wind, he muttered, trying to reassure himself and his family. But that night, Emma woke up screaming, claiming she saw something moving outside her window. Laura tried to comfort her, but the fear in her daughter's eyes was all too familiar. The next morning, Mike and Laura decided to pay Joe Hargrove a visit. They found him at his small house on the edge of town, a shadow of the man he once was. Joe greeted them with a wary smile and invited them in. We're seeing things, Joe, Mike began, his voice tense. The same kind of things we saw before the landfill came alive. Joe sighed heavily. I was afraid of that. The cleanup might have neutralized the barrels, but the radiation could have caused a mutation. Something that didn't die with the explosion. Laura leaned forward, her eyes wide. Are you saying there's still something out there? Alive? Joe nodded. I think so. And it might be even more dangerous now. If it's learned to adapt, it could be spreading. The Carters left Joe's house with a sense of dread. They knew they had to act quickly to prevent another disaster. 
Mike decided to contact Dr. Emily Carter, the town's doctor who had helped them during the initial incident. Dr. Carter had connections to various environmental agencies and might know what to do. When they arrived at Dr. Carter's office, she greeted them with a look of concern. I've been hearing similar reports from other residents, she said. I've already contacted the Environmental Protection Agency, but it could take weeks for them to send a team. In the meantime, we need to figure out what's going on. Dr. Carter, Mike, and Laura formed a small task force, enlisting Joe and a few other brave townspeople. They decided to investigate the areas where the strange occurrences had been reported. Armed with Geiger counters, protective gear, and makeshift weapons, they set out one night, hoping to find the source of the new terror. Their first stop was the old landfill. The cleanup crews had left for the day, and the site was eerily quiet. As they approached, the Geiger counters began to click rapidly, indicating high levels of radiation. Stay close, Dr. Carter warned. We don't know what we're dealing with. They moved cautiously through the landfill, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. Suddenly, one of the volunteers, a young man named Tom, cried out. He had stepped into a patch of dark, slimy residue that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. Before they could react, tendrils of the sludge shot out, wrapping around Tom's legs and pulling him towards a large mound of garbage. The group rushed to help, hacking at the tendrils with their tools. Tom screamed as the sludge tightened its grip, but they managed to free him, dragging him away from the mound. What the hell is that stuff? Tom gasped, his face pale with fear. Joe examined the residue, his expression grim. It's the same stuff I saw before, but it's different, stronger, more aggressive. They continued their investigation, moving deeper into the landfill. The clicking of the Geiger counters grew louder and the air grew colder. They reached a clearing where the ground seemed to pulse and throb as if alive. This must be the epicenter, Dr. Carter said, her voice barely above a whisper. Whatever's causing this is here. Suddenly, the ground erupted, and a massive, pulsating mass emerged from the garbage. It was a grotesque fusion of trash and living matter, writhing and oozing dark sludge. The group backed away, their hearts pounding with terror. We need to destroy it, Joe shouted. It's the only way to stop this. Dr. Carter pulled out a device she had brought along, a high-powered flamethrower used for controlled burns and forest management. This should do the trick, she said, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. Joe and the others kept the tendrils at bay as Dr. Carter aimed the flamethrower at the pulsating mass. She squeezed the trigger, and a jet of flame shot out, engulfing the creature. The mass writhed and screamed, a horrifying sound that echoed through the landfill. The fire spread quickly, consuming the creature and the surrounding garbage. The tendrils recoiled and dissolved, and the Geiger counters began to click more slowly, indicating that the radiation levels were dropping. As the flames died down, the group stood in stunned silence, watching the smoldering remains of the creature. They had done it. They had destroyed the source of the terror. But the victory felt hollow, knowing the damage that had already been done. The EPA arrived the next day, taking over the site and conducting a thorough investigation. They confirmed that the barrels of radioactive waste had caused a mutation, creating the living mass of garbage. The site was declared a permanent hazardous zone, and the town was once again evacuated for safety. The residents of Millwood were relocated, their town forever tainted by the horrors of the landfill. The Carters moved to a new town, hoping to start fresh, but the memories of what they had endured haunted them. As the years passed, the story of the cursed landfill became a chilling legend, a cautionary tale of human recklessness and the unforeseen consequences of tampering with nature. And though the landfill was gone, the fear and trauma it had caused lingered, a dark shadow over the lives of those who had witnessed the terror firsthand. The Carters tried to rebuild their lives in a new town, but the fear and trauma followed them. Lily, once a cheerful and vibrant child, became withdrawn and anxious. Mike and Laura found it hard to sleep, haunted by nightmares of the pulsating mass and the tendrils of sludge that had almost taken their lives. One evening, about six months after the incident, the family was sitting in their new living room, trying to enjoy a quiet night together. The news was on, and the anchor was discussing a series of mysterious animal disappearances in nearby towns. Laura reached for the remote to change the channel when she heard a faint, all-too-familiar tapping sound coming from the window. Her heart skipped a beat. She glanced at Mike, who had also heard it. He put a finger to his lips, 
signaling her to stay quiet. Slowly he got up and approached the window, his mind racing with fear and dread. He pulled back the curtain and shone a flashlight into the darkness. The yard was empty, but the tapping continued, louder now and more insistent. It's back, Mike whispered, his voice trembling. We need to leave, now. Laura nodded, grabbing Lily and heading towards the front door. But as they stepped outside, they were met with a horrifying sight. The ground was covered in dark, slimy sludge, and the air was filled with a sickly, metallic stench. Tendrils of the sludge began to creep towards them, moving with a life of their own. Get in the car, Mike shouted, opening the door and ushering his family inside. He started the engine and sped away, the tapping sound echoing in his ears. The sludge seemed to follow them, spreading across the streets and oozing from the sewers. They drove to the nearest police station, but it was already too late. The town was in chaos, with people running in all directions, trying to escape the encroaching sludge. The police were overwhelmed, unable to contain the spreading horror. Desperate, Mike called Dr. Carter, who had moved to a nearby town. It's back, he said, his voice filled with panic. The sludge is spreading again. We don't know what to do. Dr. Carter's voice was grim. I'm on my way. Meet me at the old mill on the outskirts of town. We need to contain this before it spreads any further. Mike hung up and drove towards the mill, his mind racing. He couldn't shake the feeling that they were facing an even greater threat than before. The sludge seemed more aggressive, more determined to consume everything in its path. When they arrived at the mill, Dr. Carter was already there, along with Joe Hargrove and a few other townspeople who had helped them before. They quickly formulated a plan to use explosives and chemicals to contain and neutralize the sludge. We don't have much time, Dr. Carter said, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. We need to act now. <laughs> they set up the explosives around the perimeter of the mill, hoping to create a barrier that would trap the sludge. As they worked, the ground trembled and the air grew colder. The tendrils of sludge were closing in, creeping ever closer. Everyone get back! Joe shouted, lighting the fuse. The explosion rocked the mill, sending a shockwave through the ground. The barrier held for a moment, but then the sludge surged forward, more powerful than ever. It consumed the mill, dissolving the wood and metal as if they were nothing. We need to fall back, Mike said, his voice filled with desperation. It's too strong. They retreated to higher ground, watching in horror as the sludge spread across the landscape, consuming everything in its path. The sky darkened, and a thick, noxious fog rolled in, choking the air and making it difficult to breathe. This isn't just a mutation, Dr. Carter said, her voice barely audible over the roar of the advancing sludge. It's something far worse. It's adapting, growing stronger with each passing moment. As the sludge closed in, Mike held his family close, his mind racing for a solution. They were running out of time. The town was being consumed and there was no escape. Suddenly, the ground beneath them began to shake violently, and a massive fissure opened up, swallowing the mill and the surrounding area. The sludge poured into the fissure, disappearing into the depths of the earth. The ground trembled for a moment longer and then everything was still. The carters and the others stood in stunned silence, watching as the fissure closed, sealing the sludge beneath the earth. The air was filled with an eerie silence, broken only by the distant sounds of sirens and the cries of the survivors. It's over, Joe said, his voice filled with relief. It's finally over. But Dr. Carter shook her head. No, it's not. The sludge is still down there, waiting. It may be contained for now, but it's only a matter of time before it resurfaces. We need to find a permanent solution, or this nightmare will never truly end. The survivors returned to their devastated town, determined to rebuild and find a way to prevent the sludge from ever rising again. But the fear and trauma remained a constant reminder of the horrors they had faced. As the years passed, the story of the living sludge became a chilling legend, a warning to future generations about the dangers of tampering with nature and the consequences of human recklessness. The fissure was sealed and monitored, but the fear never truly faded. The Carters tried to move on, but the memory of the sludge and the terror it had brought haunted their every waking moment. They knew that the darkness was still out there, lurking beneath the surface, waiting for the right moment to strike again. And though they had survived, they were forever changed by the horror they had endured, knowing that the nightmare was never truly over. The tapping sound continued, 
a sinister reminder that the sludge was always watching, always waiting, ready to rise again and consume everything in its path. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video.